Well, good morning, everybody. How are you? Great start to the day, right? Yeah? Um, my name is Ray Boshara. I direct the Center for Household Financial Stability at the St. Louis Fed. And it's uh, great to be here. I first of all want to thank the conveners of today's, uh, today's event, and as well as the financial supporters that made it possible. Um, some of you know that I spent nine years at the New America Foundation before joining the Fed three years ago, and I have to say I, uh, I don't miss being a grant seeker, but I do miss working with folks like uh, B.T. Ware and Brandy McHale and other folks who are uh, just fabulous partners to work with. Um, because I work for the Fed, I now need to say that these are my own views and not necessarily the views, and I'm glad that I remembered to say that. <laughs> So um, we're gonna, I'm going to start off with two questions here on the, on the Millennial Challenge. First, you know, how did we get here? How did this symposium, this symposium uh, come into being? And here I'll say a little bit more about what Reid alluded to about some of the research we did at the St. Louis Fed that brought us here. And then second is, what, you know, what is my brief take on the Millennial Challenge? And then we'll turn it over to, 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 the, to the real Millennials on the panel here. <laughs> so, so how did this uh, symposium come together? Well, when, we, uh, when I started at the Fed a few years ago, we, uh, you know, I've been working in this field of building savings and assets. I think the experience of the recession made it very clear that we can no longer talk about just savings and assets. We had to talk about debt and the entire family balance sheet, given the role that debt had played in bringing down both families and the economy. So that was our framework. And then uh, under the leadership of our senior economic advisor, Bill Emmons, who we'll hear from soon, uh, we decided to focus on um, demographic drivers of balance sheet health, kind of get away from income as a determinant. Um, and we focused in particular on age, race, and education. And we found that younger, non-white, and less educated families both lost the most amount of wealth from the recession and were the slowest to recover it. And it turned out, to our surprise, that age actually ended up being the strongest predictor of who lost and who recovered their wealth, even controlling for race and education. This was a pretty remarkable finding. And then moreover, we thought, well, we should look back a little bit further, go beyond the Great Recession and see what happened. And we, so we went back 25 years, um, and it turns out that if you look at older Americans, uh, those over, over age 60, uh, in real terms, they had doubled their wealth in basically one generation over, over you know, about 30 years. Middle, middle income, middle-aged Americans, those aged 40 to 60, um, in fact, increased their wealth by two-thirds over that period. But younger Americans, those under age 40, in fact, had lost 10% of their wealth in real terms. Uh, when pressed for reasons, we cited weaker labor markets, uh, the rising cost of higher education, reliance on loans to pay for that education, and perhaps um, a little surprisingly, um, the role that luck simply played when they were born. You know, that, that, that younger Americans simply happened to follow some of the luckiest generations that America may ever see. So it was just poor timing. It was uh, poor timing. So, you know, we were troubled and kind of fascinated by these findings about age, and so we decided to convene a research symposium on, the very, on this very topic. That was held uh, in May in St. Louis. Um, but we thought, after the symposium, I thought, God, this is really rich with insights, and I, I just didn't want to stop with research. I didn't want to stop with the balance sheet. And, um, you know, since I spent nine years at New America and 20 in D.C. in total, I'm kind of a policy guy at heart. So I called Reed and my colleagues, former colleagues at New America, and said, what can we do about this? You know, can we think a little bit beyond uh, research, think beyond balance sheets? And Reed and I together hatched this idea of, of, of a, a cross-cutting policy symposium looking at a, you know, a pretty broad range uh, pretty broad range of issues. Um, now, to give it some credibility, Reed and I thought that uh, even though we are uh, cutting edge, uh, we are aging Gen Xers, um, and thought we needed to bring some real millennials into the discussion to, to add some credibility to, to what we're doing here. So um, I called Jen Mishori first, uh, because we had done an event together on student loans uh, at the St. Louis Fed, and they then in turn brought in the Roosevelt uh, Campus Network. And, uh, and I think they've learned a little bit from us, but I believe we've learned a lot more from them on how to do this right. So uh, let me just uh, offer a couple of brief thoughts on what I think is the millennial challenge, millennium, millennial challenge, and then we'll turn it over to our uh, panelists here. 
Um, since the May Symposium, the Federal Reserve has released new data on the, on, on the, on the wealth and income of families. It just came out in September. And um, we had been expecting a recovery. We thought, you know, we'd seen signs and other data that, that the, we'd kind of turned the corner on the recession. But in fact, uh, things got worse for everybody. Things got worse for every group between 2010 and 2013. And um, uh, you know that this uh, that this balance sheet recession was in fact stronger and deeper than we had imagined. You know that the that the that the Great Recession had cast a much longer shadow um, on the recovery and on and on struggling Americans than we had anticipated. Um, now, no one was spared uh, uh, in this recession, and again, the numbers got worse for everybody. But it was particularly harsh on younger Americans, and. Um, um, and you know, uh, you know, just more generally, we we found that um, looking at the recovery overall, we had about a third of Americans who were doing fine. Uh, we call these the uh, thrivers. They're better educated, they're older, and they tend to be white or Asian. Overall, they are thriving. They're doing well. They recovered. They lost wealth, but they recovered it pretty quickly. And overall, they're doing pretty well. The remaining two thirds of the population we call strugglers, uh, less educated, younger, and and they tend to be um, um, uh, belonging to a minority or a, a historically disadvantaged, disadvantaged group. They're two thirds of the population. In many ways, if you look at family wealth, which is a really important barometer of your well-being and how well you could do in the future, we have a new economic divide in America. And it really is this divide between strugglers and thrivers. And with two thirds of Americans not yet fully recovering their wealth, um, you know, this is, this is troubling. It's troubling for these families, and it's also, I think, troubling for the recovery um, of the economy. So as I mentioned, younger Americans are among those uh, strugglers, um, and uh, the, the recession had a particularly hard, uh, a, a, a pretty bad effect on them. And, and, and as we mentioned, the, the, what was really challenging is that they hit the labor market um, during the Great Recession and, and its aftermath, leading to reductions in both their income um, and, their, um, and their wealth. So I see two key challenges challenges here, two key questions that we have to think about for millennials. First question is, how permanent are these reductions in income and wealth? You know, can in fact they recover? Or is this something, is this something that's just going to persist throughout their lifetimes? And then second, thinking a little bit more broadly, um, you, know, you know, given that, uh, you know, what we learned about the wealth levels of younger Americans being below what they were for previous generations of younger Americans, um, you know, can, can they ever either reach or exceed the wealth achieved by previous generations of younger Americans? You know, the, the part of the American myth or dream is that every generation does better and better, and for the first time, we have a generation, at least in terms of wealth, that may not uh, exceed the wealth of, of, of their parents or grandparents at a similar age. So are we entering kind of a new normal here? Um, I'm not really sure. And again, this challenge is especially acute for younger Americans who are minority, lack skills, education, and networks. Now, I don't want to end on that note. It's a little daunting. Um, I would like to uh, mention something that uh, the demographer, Neil Howe, uh, shared with us at our May Research Symposium, uh, which I thought was really interesting. And it's this idea that, that um, every generation reimagines the American dream for itself. It thinks anew. Um, it thinks fresh about who we are and what is success and what we're trying to achieve. And you know they define it in their terms, not in our terms. And we have to be careful about imposing our view of the American dream or the boomer view of the American dream onto these these uh, uh, current millennials. And you know there are signs of encouragement, of course. I mean, you know, uh, I was looking at the uh, White House. Uh, report that came out a couple of days ago, 15 Economic Facts on Millennials, number three, says that they, they, they value family time and social networks and, and want to have meaningful careers. You know, and so maybe their meaning, their, their, their success, their definition of success has more to do with meaning than it has to do with material possessions or, you know, which, if that's the case, I think that's great. And it doesn't preclude the challenges of having what is, uh, what Brandy described as financial security, how we get there I think is very different, but if success isn't the two cars in the garage in a suburb, that's, I think that's actually a pretty good thing. 
So, um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to first to Jen, then to Sarah, and to Lauren Allen. And let me just do a, a, a couple of brief uh, introductions before I do so. You all have extended bios. Um, Jen Mishori is Executive Director of Young Invincibles. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, participated in a student loan forum with us uh, uh, last year. Um, Sarah Adela is the Policy Director of Generation Progress. And Lauren Allen McCann is an organizer, tech policy expert, and a civic innovation fellow at the Open Technology Institute at New America. Not the New America Foundation, I'm learning, at New America. So let me pause and turn it over to Jen. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, I'm really excited to be here today, and thank you so much for, to everyone who worked so hard over the last couple of months to put this together. Uh, Young Invincibles actually got started about five years ago around the healthcare debate. And we got started because we felt like the youth voice, the millennial voice, wasn't really present or wasn't present in a way that was genuine, authentic, really representing the challenges and perspectives of young people in that debate. So young people wanted health coverage. Young people were struggling to get health coverage because they couldn't afford it, because they were struggling with a lot of these economic challenges that we've seen over the last couple of decades. Um, but stakeholders, politicians, and media, they weren't always uh, providing that perspective in a way that was accurate, that was based in data, um, that was based in the perspective of this generation. So we found that in healthcare, and as we got started, as we uh, engage in this research, we found this in all these other ranges of economic challenges facing this generation. Access to higher education, access to employment. Um, really identifying the trends and challenges that this generation was facing was crucial to being able to then identify solutions. Um, and, and over the last five years, we've, we've really found that um, those challenges are unique. Um, they've been happening over the past couple of decades, but we've also seen challenges that have really been exacerbated since the Great Recession. So I want to talk very briefly about uh, one example of a trend that we've really focused on. We're going to talk more about it later, but I think really, uh, really shows the kinds of trends that we've been seeing over the last couple of years, and that's higher education. So someone going to college in 1980 uh, could go to school full time, they could work uh, a minimum wage job over the summer, and they could not only pay for their school, but they could leave with about $1,000 uh, extra to cover their additional expenses. That is absolutely impossible to do today, as, as most of us in this room understand. You can go to school today, you can work over the summer at a minimum wage job, you can maybe pay for half of your tuition at a, at a four-year public school, um, and you're left with about $5,000 uh, in tuition that you need to try and cover somehow. Um, so those trends have been uh, going on for several decades. Now, we also know those trends have been exacerbated in the last five years since the Great Recession. Another example, um, when my mom went to college in the 1970s, she went to a public school. She probably paid about less than $1,000 in today's dollars to go to college. When I went to school, I graduated from college in 2007. Uh, I paid about six or $7,000 a year to go to a public institution, much higher. Um, so a pretty good deal in comparison, although uh, significantly higher than my mom. Seven years later, that same school cost $13,000 to go. That's UCLA, my alma mater. Um, so we're seeing trends that are based in uh, decades of state disinvestment, but then also really, really high disinvestment since the Great Recession. And those trends are mirrored in other economic trends that we're seeing in employment, um, in access to health coverage, et cetera. Um, so we're excited to be here today to talk about those trends um, and to really work to closely define the nuances of these challenges that are facing young people. Um, because I think that you hear a lot about these challenges uh, in the media, you hear a lot of discussion about millennials, um, but really digging into the data and figuring out what's going on will help us uh, better define the solutions that we want to see. So Sarah, I want to hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Jen. And thanks, um, everyone, for being here today. I thank you so much for inviting me to uh, be on this panel. Uh, my name is Sarah Aldello, and I am the Policy Director of Generation Progress. We are the millennial engagement arm of the Center for American Progress. Um, quick question, because this is a panel where I actually can like see people in the audience. How many of you are millennials, or whether you like, identify as that or not? You're born within the age range. 
All right. Okay. So <laughs> me too. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and it's really exciting to be in a space talking about the millennial generation with so many millennials in the room because obviously you all are the experts uh, in this conversation, and we have a lot of data uh, that we're going to be talking about. But at the end of the day, this data like reflects a lot of the lived experiences that we all have. Uh, one of the things that I think is so important when we're talking about the millennial generation is who are we talking about? Well, someone mentioned earlier that the millennial generation is over 40% people of color. And this is something that uh, is at the core of our work at Generation Progress, because if we are not minimally reflective in the room of what those demographics look like, then how in the heck are we going to come up with solutions to better help the millennial generation? So, but what does that mean, though, in the work that we do? Well, that means that you know, when we're talking about things like access to higher education, we need to look and see not only how the generation overall is doing, but how are African American youth doing, how are Latino youth doing, how are API youth doing, how are Native American youth doing. And while we've been seeing some really positive trends about youth of color going to college, um, it, it, we're, still, we're still not there. We're not doing good enough. When we look at unemployment rates uh, and, we are, and we see the trends among young people, we also have to look about African American youth unemployment Unemployment rates, which are three times the national average, and Latino youth unemployment rates, which are, which are double the national average. If we're not looking in at these very specific groups, then we're not looking at the generation because the generation is made up of people of color. I think the other thing that we need to really focus on as well is looking at uh, the amount of LGBT young people in the millennial generation. By LGBT, for those who don't know, I mean lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender young people. Uh, over 6% of the millennial generation identifies as LGBT. This is double what older generations identify as. At the same time, when we look at things like um, access to jobs or who's out in jobs, one, we don't have data, which is really troubling about queer youth and their ability to find jobs and be employed. But what we do see is that for those who are working, who, is, who are out in the workplace, the older generation is out at much higher rates than the younger generation. Something like 40% of LGBT adults are out in the workplace, whereas it's only about 5% of LGBT young people. Now, this might shock people. It shocked me, because when people talk about queer youth, we're like, oh, people are coming out younger. There's a lot of amazing activism, activism and organizing happening. But if we look at trends around unemployment, young queer youth are freaking out about the idea of losing their jobs. At the end of the day, millennials want stability. This is something that we've seen in our polling and with talking with young people. And if you don't have a job, then you're not able to take care of yourself and your families. So what we've been seeing and talking with queer youth is they're doing things like wiping uh, a lot of their identity from their resumes and from their social networks. And so we're where you know, maybe you in college, uh, if you were able to go to college, you were a part of your pride group and you worked at your resource center and maybe you volunteered on a campaign, which is amazing and things that I would look for when I'm hiring. But we see from queer youth, they're taking all of this off their resume, which makes a resume not as strong. And that's just something that we're very concerned about because again, there's this idea out there that, oh, it's 2014, you can totally be out and fine. But that's not necessarily what we're seeing when we're talking with young people. And I wish we had more data on this, but unfortunately, there's that question that are asked around sexual orientation and gender identity in so many of these surveys. So I say this when we're talking about the diversity of the generation. Diversity, yes, means racial ethnic. It also means um, sexual orientation and gender identity. But what it also means is like uh, is your country of origin. And something that came out in the White House report, which I thought was fascinating, is that about 15% of the millennial generation was not born in the United States. And maybe some people are undocumented. Maybe some people are documented. Maybe some people have green cards or are citizens now. But that also means something very different for what we're talking about, because we haven't seen those numbers since the early, early 20th century. So we are a generation that is diverse in so many different ways, and if we're not reflecting those voices in our spaces, and what we like to do at Generation Progress is we have summits and conversations, and we bring young people together to talk about um, all of these issues and to bring all of their identities to the table, because for us, one of those uh, things that we get really excited about, because yes, we are quite optimistic as the millennial generation, is that we see these issues so um, in a very intersectional way. We can't talk about unemployment without talking about our, our own identity. Um, be it as an immigrant, be it as a queer young person, be it as a Latino or Afri African American, they all come together. As someone who started off in reproductive justice spaces, who is now working in economic spaces, like I love these conversations because it, at the end of the day, whether or not you can have a child or support a child is also an economic decision and a part of your economic well-being. Um, so. I'm really excited to jump in further, further in this conversation and to really discuss, yes, let's talk about the millennial generation, all the hopes and dreams and promises that there is to come, but also the challenges that we face as we live uh, with these varied identities in our everyday lives. 
Perfect. I want to like stand up and be like, yeah. <laughs> so actually, just kind of piggyback on what you're saying, Sarah. To, as the tech policy person, I'm supposed to now talk to you about Facebook. And look, millennials are using online media to talk to each other. And we have a new sense of connectivity because of that. But I think, again, that's too much of a general perspective on how millennials, how people are actually using technologies. And even taking a step back, what kind of technologies we're building in the era of millennials. Right now, it matters less um, the fact that Twitter exists than the fact that Twitter has become the organizing platform for not just Ferguson, but for Occupy. We're, re we're seeing movements happen in real time at a variety of scales, internationally, yes, but also here in the US, that are intersectional in their nature. I think this doesn't come up enough when we actually sit down to talk about technology tools. We get scared talking about how younger people are actually using them to address systematic racism and classism, because in general, we're quite uncomfortable talking about systematic racism and classism. But you know what? I'd say that's part of what it means to be a millennial. Um, I get torn between thinking about this generation as an entire collection of that kid from The Emperor Has No Clothes or Peter Pan. I mean, we are optimistic, but we are also in this place where we've kind of at the end of our rope. Mm -hmm. I don't have much more to add than what's been said on terms of like the economic landscape, but the fact that we have seen Occupy and Ferguson in the last five years alone means that we have a generation of people who are tired of just dealing with rhetoric and who are at a point where they want things to be taken literally. We can't just talk about housing numbers if we're not talking about people who don't have access to housing in a very literal and substantive way. And yes, that involves technology. Um, but if we were actually thinking about technology in the millennial context, we'd look at how these technologies are being decentralized. We'd look at how community wireless is happening. And often it actually isn't driven by millennials. It's often done in older generations. And this is where I kind of bring up the idea that we are also Peter Pan, right? And when I say we, I'm talking about the majority white demographic that controls a lot of the narrative. Um, Often when we have conversations about technology in the millennial era, we are talking about smartphone usage among a certain white population, and then we stare at black Twitter and we kind of drool a little bit because it's completely fascinating to us. And if you're not familiar with black Twitter, I'm gonna leave you to Google. Uh, <laughs> But the, the whole point of this is to say like, what's in everyone's interest in the millennial generation, we are missing the ways in which this should be an intersectional point to look at age more generally, to look at how when we develop tools and technologies and also target our, our politics at different demographics, right? We are in a post-Obama generation where we have convinced ourselves that it's going to be young people running campaigns that's gonna change politics. At the same time, ignoring how burnt out we all are with politics, how campaigns and campaign technology have burned us out on what it means to live in a governing system. It's an interest, you can look at this fact two ways. One is that, um, so the fact is that millennials are registering as Republicans and Democrats less than any other generation, and yet we have a higher opinion of Congress. Um, the political geek in me wants to read that as a desire for governance, a desire not just for this Af like a, a, amorphous concept of policy, but actually to see the system work and to see the system work for everyone. You could also look at that as complete disengagement, as the gaps that exist growing bigger and the people on the one side of that line growing farther and farther away from access to power. But however we slice it, this is the generation that is gonna get real about power, that is gonna be talking about power in everything that we do, and that I think that's gonna be pervasive throughout all the conversations in the next two days. And to the extent that we are able to tap into the history of the generations that came before us, because surely power dialogues are not new, uh, and to the extent that millennials my, my kin, especially my kin in technology, are capable of applying history to the present text. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting developments, but I, I basically just want to re-echo this idea that we are, we are intersectional, and what we can't do in our conversations is isolate it just to this particular demographic. Hmm. Great, thank you all. So uh, let me begin with one question, and then we'll turn it over to the to the audience. Um, so fascinating insights on education, identity, power. I, I love it all. But what's what's it all aiming towards? What's success? Um, you know, Neil Howe, in his generational analysis, as I mentioned, um, noted that each generation defines the American dream for itself. And so, in your view, what what is the American dream for uh, millennials? What is success? You know, I think, so we actually did some polling on this question a few years ago, and we said, um, you know, do you think that you're going to be better off than your parents' generation? 
Um, and about half of the respondents, this was 18 to 34 year olds, said no. They didn't think they were gonna be better off than their parents' generation. Um, but we also asked, do you think that you'll achieve the American dream? And about 70% said yes. We do think we're gonna achieve the American dream. Um, so, yeah, I don't think you could read a lot in, into those uh, sort of two, two responses. Um, but what I like to think about those, those numbers are that young people do think they're gonna achieve the American dream, but that might look different. Um, in fact, it probably will look different than other generations. Success will look different. To your point earlier, uh, perhaps that's a good thing. I think there's probably going to be a lot of bad things about that because we've been facing a lot of economic challenges over the past couple decades um, that are going to decrease household wealth, wealth excuse me, um, and you know other challenges that are going to start to manifest themselves. Um, but I do think that success will look different, and and we're already seeing that in terms of. Uh, the numbers of young people who are waiting to buy homes, who are waiting to get married, who are waiting to have kids. Um, just the definition of what success looks like um, in your 30s is going to look different. I think, I think the question of the American dream is really interesting, and I, I bring it back to, uh, I want to go back to the comment I, meant earlier, I made earlier about diversity in the generation, right? Millennials are over 40% people of color, and I think we have to remember that for communities of color, the American dream has been something that we've been like striving for for a very long time and have not ever reached. Um, and so this idea of what is an American, American dream uh, is, like Jen said, like we want it, but it, yes, it's going to look really different, and there's going to be different milestones in our lives that are like part of us getting there. I, I, I feel like there's this new life milestone where it's uh, paying off all your student loans. I don't know if like folks <laughs> have like I seen, there yet. Right? I, I have <laughs> nowhere near there, but like I noticed like on Facebook and stuff, people like. My friends will say, oh my god, I just paid off my last student loan. And then everyone's like, Yay! oh my god, I can do that someday. What? I would be able to pay off my student loans? That's and crazy. previous generations would have parties to burn their mortgage when it was paid off. So the idea, so I've, I've heard of this about burning your mortgage off, and I'm like, wow, getting a mortgage, that sounds great. Um, so maybe someday that will happen. Then you can burn that too. Right? Maybe. Yeah, I'd love to burn that. Um, there have been folks who've been talking about burning, burning promissory notes for student loans. You know, there, but... Um, there's this America dream, like we, we all want to have, you know, we want to be able to support ourselves and our families. And that's going to look very different depending on who we're talking to. Because for some of us, supporting ourselves and our families means that it might mean having kids, but it might mean not. It might mean getting married, it might mean not. It might mean um, supporting our parents who are either, who are not doing well or who, um, but it also might not mean that as well. And so I think the American dream for the millennial generation is the flexibility to make these decisions for ourselves and not to have them made for us. So for example, when we talk about um, my friends who are working and, uh, and have kids, the idea to choose whether or not to stay home or to put your ch kids in childcare, like that is a real economic decision for most of my friends. And it's certainly not a, oh, it's because I want to be a stay-at-home mom or not, or I want to be a stay-at-home dad. It's because I don't want my paycheck to go all to childcare, or because, <laughs> and, or I don't want to just, um, or I do want to stay at home because that, that's what would be the decision. Like, this, the decision is being made for us. And so I, for me, and in talking with um, my friends and with the young people that we've been working with, it, the American dream is like decision, is the ability to make decisions for ourselves and not for them to be made for us. So. And to that point, to create the policy levers that open up those decisions, right? Exactly. That those be, opportunities. Exactly. It means things like childcare not being more expensive than college. It means things like paid sick days ha and having family Having childcare at all. Having childcare at all. Goodness, my friend is about to, ready to have a baby, and for newborn care, it's $400 a week, and that's the cheapest she could find it. What? That's crazy. So, um, it's, but yeah. Well, even one of the interesting stats that doesn't get talked about too often related to marriage, right, is that uh, almost a third of millennials say that they'll never get married mm -hmm. um, with, a, with a good deal of insurance. Recently, Time Magazine did this survey of what if we offered marriage in different kinds of contracts? And they did it kind of with a tongue in cheek, like, oh, look, let's see what millennials do with this. And um, the millennials ended up rating two forms of marriage, alternative systems of marriage, incredibly highly. One was the beta marriage, where you go into a contract for two years, and then you have the opportunity at the end to either sever without any divorce, any consequences, or renegotiate your terms and extend your marriage. The other was the real estate model, where you you decided at the onset of marriage whether you were engaging in a 5, 7, 15, 20, and 35 year, I believe, contract, and then with those similar checkpoints. And everyone reading this thinks it's absurd because marriage is one thing, and marriage is a man and a woman, oh wait, no, it's not anymore. Uh, marriage is for the rest of your life, except that half of Americans get divorces. 
When you start unpacking these things, we realize that we have been living with multiple American dreams, but without necessarily identifying that. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, makes the, I, I first read this article, and perhaps it's because I have my millennial goggles on 24 seven, I just was like, yeah, this seems really sensible to let people mix and match and roll their own. Um, but it, it isn't. We are, this is one of the th perspectives that millennials are bringing into this. And when you think about that in terms of policy, it's going to mean the institution of new programs. It's also going to potentially mean, or should mean, rewriting existing programs as well. All right. So when um, us Xers and boomers think about uh, you know, risk, and we understand that you guys are you know, not quite as risk. We're not the risk takers we are. We didn't think it would apply to marriage. I mean, I, this is a pretty radical idea, I think, but it's one way of um, mitigating risk, I guess, even on, on such a fundamental institution. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, marriage and divorce are, it's one of the largest, like, financial consequences that you can enact in your life, right? I mean, you, when you share assets, there's a, number, there's a number of large financial decisions, but the mm -hmm. fact that there's even the potential for nuance in how we would approach this and thinking about different contracts, mm -hmm. it's worth considering the ways in which, um, again, to me, everything comes back to power. But if you're looking at a generation that grew up with high rates of divorce, um, a generation that also is one of the, has, I think, one of the peak rates of single motherhood, I believe, in like recent years, like we are watching what family structures mean change in real time. So why not our formal family structures? Interesting. Yes, completely radical. But then again, that's why you asked three millennials up here, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you broadened my notion of what it means to be risk averse. <laughs> Very interesting. Do we have time for some questions? Great. Um, Brown Rose, please identify yourself and your institution if you have one. And uh, uh, direct a question to any one panelist if you'd like. Um, do I see any hands? Any hands? Come on, this had to be provocative. <laughs> we could talk about Occupy more. <laughs> yes, here. Okay, For, we'll go one, two here. Hi, uh, my name is Eric. I used to be with the Roosevelt Institute and now I'm with the Alliance for Justice in town. Um, and I was really, really excited that you named power in this conversation, that you uplifted that concern, because I hear people kind of intellectualizing the feelings of millennials all the time, trying to figure out like who we are, what we are, like what brands market to us best. But the conversation about we're not just risk averse because uh, we decided you know, like uniformly that that's what we were going to do, but because we had such constraints placed on us that we grew up in a, you know, decades of violence and war, or we saw any semblance of the New Deal consensus vanish in front of us, or all these other things. So I guess I want to reframe the conversation a little bit about even within a conversation about student debt, like where our choices have evaporated and where in many cases we're risk averse because we're you know, embedded in these cycles of debt and if, almost like slaves to this kind of economic system. And so I guess I'd like to hear a little bit about in these kind of visionary ideas of what millennials need from our political system, economic system, social system, um, whether or not you see us working through institutions, outside institutions, or in some sort of hybridized situation to not just you know, envision something because Silicon Valley told us to, but because it's something that we need now in our various identities, experiences, et cetera. Yeah, thank, thank you for bringing that up. So I love these conversations of power because if we look at the millennial generation, like we are, like was mentioned earlier, we're, we're pretty pissed off as a generation if people have not realized. Um, and we're expressing it in different ways. And so, you know, some of the young people that we work with, some of our partner organizations, are not only in Ferguson right now, but are like leading the fight in Ferguson. And what people don't see through the media narrative is a lot of the media is talking to old school leaders, which is great. We love our old civil rights leaders. But there's also millennials who are like have broken off and are doing their own things and leading their own direct actions in Ferguson, in Ohio, really pushing back against police brutality that has, at this point, we can, I think, I think we can all agree has gotten out of control in this country, especially against black and brown young people. Um, on the other, and, but that's not, that's one set of issues. There's other issues as well. I mean, if we look at uh, reproductive rights and access to abortion care, I mean, look what happened in Texas. Those were young people who took over the Texas state capitol who were pushing Wendy Davis, Leticia Vanderpete on to, uh, to force the filibuster. 
that was that those people, that was young people who were leading that fight. Young people are the ones who are knocking on doors to get folks registered to vote. Young people are the ones who are turning out in elections. And so, but, but we're doing both and, right? We're trying to work within these systems because we get there as a system to be worked in. Um, but we're also creating our own systems as well. And for one of the things that I love to talk about with millennial generation is like everyone, like year 2020. 2020 is really important for a couple of reasons. One, all millennials will be able to vote. Um, not only will all millennials be able to vote, but we're gonna be 40% 40, 40 of the voting block. And that should really freak out people who are controlling these old systems of power because it's, it's, it's not gonna stay the same. <laughs> Things are going to change. Um, now, of course, I am very concerned because we as the millennial generation have to keep working with our brothers and sisters to make sure we are engaged because there are intentional efforts out there to like, get us to be quiet um, and to get us to stay home and to get us to stop caring. But uh, I think perhaps it's like that option optimism that we have where we kind of don't care about that for now and we're going to keep pushing whether it's an access to choice, whether it's an access to jobs and employment and apprenticeships, what, to, the, to be able to join a union. Why can't we join unions at rates that our parents join unions? That's crazy. Um, so, uh, but yes, power is absolutely at the core, but the year 2020, like that is one of those big markers that we have because our generation is going to show its power, yes now, but also then. One of the other interesting elements, I think, to think about this, right, especially now that, it, that we have Ferguson as a living example of how you have external power structures organizing, right? You have actual individual people pulling together using social media, um, where formal institutions have gotten involved, where formal institutions have helped steward that, mm -hmm. uh, and you do have that kind of collaboration. But then it's interesting to take a step back and look within the context of young people mobilizing and using these distributed technologies where we've seen it not work as well. People have a lot of different opinions on Occupy, mm -hmm. um, but Occupy could have become the offline mobilization effort that translated into the student loan debt revival, right? There was a huge movement where people pulled, it was like November 16th, I participated in it, I left my bank and I went into a local credit union. There was massive mobilization on these very small scales, but it never leveled up into a movement to affect policy in that way. Mm -hmm. By contrast, we have the Dreamers, which was a you know an undocumented youth movement that was incredibly decentralized and actually had a lot of conflicts with major institutions when they came in to help them organize. And actually, if you come tomorrow to the political participation panel, we'll have somebody there who actually helped organize from the Dreamer side mm -hmm. um, to talk about this more. Mm -hmm. And I think that is we're looking forward into these patterns. And we're, and we're thinking about 2020, and we're thinking about beyond 2020, watching this relationship between formal institutions and real individual people is going to be the fascinating element in terms of like how power gets used, whether power gets co-opted, and also how these institutions evolve. Institutions that can play well with others, institutions that can take a step back, and that can let, when people are mobilizing on the ground in Ferguson, that can let that happen instead of getting involved and being like, by the way, this is you know CNBC, are going to be the ones, I hope, that will kind of evolve or die in this process. But that's, to me, the big challenge that millennials are putting outward in terms of formal institutions of power. But on Occupy though, some of those organizers are like one, many are still organizing and they, a lot of them just bought out student debt of those who were attending for-profit colleges. Like that was amazing. So you still see some of that, like those remnants still happening today. And I think that's the other thing in terms of like, what is power, right? Power isn't just like something that's there and gone. Power is something that's built. It's a muscle. It's something accumulated. Mm -hmm. Occupy is still happening. Mm -hmm. There's Occupy radio reaches, I believe over like 60 countries around the world. One of the headquarters is here in DC. Mm -hmm. These movements don't die just because the hashtag loses attention. I, I certainly know that uh, you know if, if you have ambitions to redirect social spending, um, it's heavily tilted towards previous generations. Uh, Phil Longman's done a lot of work on this. Mm -hmm. If there's any hope of sort of having more resources geared towards younger generations, you're going to need a lot of power. Mm -hmm. um, can I have uh, hands? Anybody who'd like to make a question or a comment? I think we're going to take three. Uh, together, and then we'll turn it over to the panelists. So, one, there was one over here earlier. Um, any other, any other folks? Okay, um, Steve, and then. Hi, I'm, I'm Christy Green. I've uh, been in academia. I'm actually trying to get out of it. Uh, but one thing I've often heard as an academic is that I need to teach diversity every in by race, gender, everything. And I've started to wonder why, and I'm a Gen Xer, when I teach millennials, should I be teaching them something or should they be teaching me? Mm -hmm. So is there something that needs to be taught about diversity? Okay, hold on. I'm going to take a couple more. Steve, and then do I have a third? Okay, great. 
Uh, as a jet Xer, it's great to see all Any the... Uh, oh, Steve Oriel. I'm actually an advisor locally. He's been working in financial security for the last 20 years. And um, I guess two pieces of good news. Uh, one, just on the diversity front, for the first time I know in my career, both the uh, CEOs of my professional association and primary company are both women. So I want you guys to know on the private sector side, there's progress being made, but we can kind of work together on all these issues. So thanks. And yes, here, please. I'm stuck. I think I'm a little stuck. Yep. <laughs> I'm Emily Baxter. Uh, I work at the Center for American Progress. And um, I was wondering if you guys, you talked about this a bit, but do you take a cynical or an optimistic view on, you know, hashtag activism, on clicktivism, or slacktivism? Mm -hmm. um, and has anyone done any research on that? Great. Do you guys want to respond to one, one of those questions? or? Sure. Um, I mean, I could take, certainly I'll start with the last question. Um, I, I take a pretty optimistic view about um, online engagement. Uh, you know, I think that we've seen example after example of young people using technology to um, make their voices heard and uh, institutions responding to that. Um, I think there's certainly examples where um, you know you can take the cynical view and perhaps might be right to do so. But as a whole, um, we uh, I don't know that there's been and maybe you can jump in here if you know uh, differently than I do um, significant research um, looking into that. Except that we know of specific examples where we've seen it work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, well one to answer your question also to go back to about teaching diversity like. It's, it's, bo it's both and, right? We can all, I, I think some of the best classrooms that I've ever been in um, are ones where, yes, the teacher is teaching, but the class is also teaching as well. As, as someone who uh, worked with students with special needs for two years, that was the experience of my classroom. And that was how we actually, I, I was able to do the most teaching was when I like, was talking to my students, like, listen, Yes, I'm like Mexican American, but my Spanish is awful, and yours is much better than mine. But so if you can work with me on my Spanish, then I'm going to work with you on reading. And that is like by bringing both of us to a similar playing field. That that is how like the best education has happened in my experience. Oh, there's Mike there. Um, uh, but also, diversity is not just like you have to also live diversity, right? So it's like, who is in our classroom? Who are we reading? Where are we going? What are these, and are we creating space for those, especially in academia, and depending on where you teach. I went to Georgetown, not the most diverse campus that there is, but how do we also create space for those with diverse experiences to be able to participate in the classroom? Because uh, not frequently, and like very frequently, we're just, we're just kind of shut down in those spaces. Um, because for many of us, we've not been in majority white spaces and to be able, or spaces that are uh, different from our own identities and when we are in a minority. So maybe it's making sure we have create, create space for those with disabilities. Maybe it's recreating space for those who are low income or first generation. Um, in terms of like the hashtag activism, I go back and forth. Super effective when we're targeting companies, right? I mean, goodness, like you have a bad experience at Potbellies and you tweet at them and they're like, oh my God, we're so sorry, right? Um, here's a sandwich. Here's a, here's a sandwich, we're gonna connect them right away. I had that experience. Um, but uh, I, I think there are lots of questions about, like, about policy. Now one of the most successful, well, a very successful thing I saw that was great, but things have shifted greatly talking about the Dreamers, is in the 2010 fight um, for the Dream Act to pass, I remember Dreamers were the first ones who started shutting down Facebook pages uh, for senators. And they were like the first movement who was like, you know what, we are all going to go on this, we're going to like this senator we don't like, and uh, we are going to all post the same time, the same message. And so eventually, like they literally, like these were not offices that were necessarily opening doors to us, but when we shut down their Facebook page, they knew that we were there. Um, and so I think success can be defined in many different ways, and we have to like tease out what that means online, because sometimes it means getting people to pay attention to you who won't open the door to have a meeting. Um, maybe, it, hopefully, it means like getting more legislation passed. Yeah. Well, so, um, well, can yeah, I just jump I, in yeah. really quickly and say it? So my, my feeling with hashtag activism is like, it's great. Our, our generation is like totally full of meme ability, which is the ability to like pattern an idea and then spread it, and we can all tap into the idea and we need to go back to it. But that, to me, feeds into a very problematic perspective of what politics is. Mm -hmm. That keeps 
power on the outside where the many are always going to the few and banging on the door and saying, please let us in, we have this amazing cat meme. Or please let us in, we have this hashtag that is very powerful and when you Google search yourselves later, you will be very ashamed. <laughs> I want us to offline better. Um, to me, it's like, quick clicks, clicktivism aside, right? It's, it's actually about the ways in which politics, with the ways in which government is infiltrating our entire lives, every part of our lives. We have the opportunity to influence that in so many different ways. So how we use online tools now isn't necessarily problematic from like a learning curve, but that doesn't that shouldn't stop us from thinking about governance, about the policy process beyond legislation and our opportunities, about how city like town hall meetings are structured and what our opportunities for engagement is there. And I do think that's a challenge for millennials. I'm optimistic because I think that this idea is is, is and this research is part of my work, and if I'm here, the hive mind is obviously getting there too. But that is going to take willful action on our part to translate how we interact with online tools. And I don't think you can, I mean, using online tools is, is just that, it's a tool, right? It's a tool in the toolbox, mm -hmm. um, and it's a very, can be a very effective tool, but one of many. Yeah. Okay, we're, uh, we're getting the signal. Um, and, uh, but before we thank our panelists here, I want to note that Lauren Ellen is going to come up and talk a little bit about what comes next. So, but first of all, let's thank our panelists here for giving us up to a great start. Awesome. All right. So, in the spirit of interactivity and conversation, no, I'm not about to drop the name of the hashtag. I'm going to talk to you about how this afternoon works. Each day of the Millennials Rising Symposium, there is a policy workshop breakout session. Those are going to be our opportunities to do basically what we're doing here, but with more conversation on the different topics that each of the panels covers. Uh, we're going to convene in this room for these dialogues, and we'll be split up by topic. Uh, but these are going to be run in an unconference manner, which means that each of you will have the opportunity to contribute fully. Uh, we're going to be convening at 3.30 p.m. for the first one today, and there'll be one tomorrow at 11 a.m. after the two panels then don't have to worry about it. We'll run through all the directions ahead of time. But essentially what we're trying to get from these conversations is what you're thinking, not just like what you're thinking about as we're up here mic'd and talking to you, but also what are the challenges that you see? What are we not addressing? And what are the kind of provoking, stuck in your teeth questions that you know is, are going to take time to workshop and revolve, that are really going to take actually the hive mind to work through? So. As you're going, as you're taking notes, they know that you're not just taking notes for yourselves, potentially you're taking notes for all of us, thanks in advance. And um, I promise this will not be a painful experience because it is the last guard between us in this room and us in that room with reception afterwards. So I'll be back at 3.30 to talk some more, but look forward to having your interaction then. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody.